Well, it's so great to have the opportunity to catch up with you, Catherine, for season three. Thank you for joining me this evening. You look so lovely. I'm so happy to see you again. Thank you for having me back. It was such a great visit last time. I'm so delighted to know that I got to come back and hear your thoughts on season three. Yes, I, I mean, um, we, we see with your character, uh, Petra, in, in the past, how um, she's, she's been sort of by the book and uh, her ambition has, has been on display in, in season one and season two. Um, but kind of, she's, she's taken over obviously the mantle in season three officially for real, you know, officially, officially. Um, and, and certain situations have kind of like thrown her into the fires already. Um, yeah, she we had a tough first work week on the job. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, and um, how has Petra's kind of learning to adapt uh, and 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 her position um, with with the army and on all of this kind of her role as a mother as well at the same time? How how has how has how has she kind of learned to? by now, I guess, merge or adapt and, and into this duality of playing, having to play these two, two positions of, of motherhood and at the same time being head. I, I believe that underpinning Petra's entire motivation is her desire to be excellent and to create excellence. Um, whether it's in herself or in her daughter or in the army, I think that's where she had her first issues with Alder when Alder started to, to be more creative in her strategies, shall we say. So I don't know that Petra's ambition was solely about power as much as it was restoring excellence to something that meant a lot to her and her family and her family's legacy. And so I think I think as such, her, her drive and her, her flow is to try to make the next best excellent decision. And I think her challenges coming out of season two was that every front was on fire, her family, her, her, her you know, army, her, her, her team, like at, on, at every turn, she was faced with bad choices. As, and so to try and strive for excellence in the midst of a sea of bad challenges, I think is is testing her to her very core, and I think I think she's gone to first principles of like what's the next best decision I can make, and I think that has interestingly allowed for a lot of her growth because I think um, when when it becomes that simple, all I can do is the next right best thing. Um, you have to come to some kind of peace with that and stay very focused in the moment. So I think she. As she knows more and knows better, she tries to do better using that paradigm and that the information she's getting is, is shifting sands beneath her feet, you know, like the, the challenges from the Camarilla and not having Alder as a, a resource and a guide. Um, I don't think she ever envisioned doing this job without Alder to draw on. Um, because I think they, I think she knew in her heart of hearts that Alder did have the best at heart, even if her methods had changed. So that's a long way of answering, but I, I think that I've been giving it a lot of thought. <laughs> I mean, she's become a pro at pivoting at, at this point. <laughs> well, well call it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's one thing when you have the luxury of focusing on one goal, but when everything is upended, then now you just have to to go to the next thing that's on fire and do the best you can at putting it out. And you can't be too picky about how that happens. And sometimes there's a hand that ends up being forced regardless of uh, whatever your method may be either at the same time mm -hmm. or whatever plan or, you know, pivot <laughs> may be that, uh, yeah. that you have. So um, I certainly think that uh, the general has handled herself uh, quite glowingly, <laughs> I would say. In On case. behalf of Petra, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Uh, and and then also at the the end of season two, we had the scene with Petra fighting with Nikta against the Camarilla in the cell or the basement or you know, uh, and 
uh, you know, we, we have the scene where she says, like, the army and the spree fighting together, and, and then she says, you know, don't think of this as a reprieve either, but uh, Petra's comp, but, but this is kind of expanded also in, in season three. Um, how has her view of the spree kind of shifted as well um, in, in, this, in these circumstances at the same time, too? think she becomes more aware of what their grievance was and perhaps even her own role in that grievance in terms of perpetuating what she had been given as information and understanding about them um and again I think it falls under the when we know better we do better I don't think it means that you you forget you know two wrongs also don't make a right but I also think context provides insight and I think the more she has a context of why the spree held the views they did and behaved the way they did and you know having that universal threat against all witches army or spree um, I think prioritizes the things you want to focus on and which things you want to be mad about in the moment I think uh, you know the choice to save Nicta was I think not only to save Nikta, but to work with Nikta to save others, which I think ultimately what that was about, um, is also about starting to not see Nikta in not the black and white of what she'd been fed, but in the shades of gray that allow for compromise and understanding and growth and change and evolution. So I think that's what that was about. And certainly we've seen, you know, spree work has become an asset amongst them and necessity in a, in a sense as well, because mm -hmm. of the distances apart and having to shelter or, you know, having to hide certain portions of either through Fort Salem or of course through um, Abigail and everyone being in the session. So um, the spree work has actually come in, <laughs> not necessarily through Nicta, but through Scylla as well, someone who also has really kind of been seen as an enemy in a way as well. Um, but I think as you get more understanding about Nicta, you get the appeal of Nicta and her movement to others as well. So I think there is that expanded understanding of, of that. And I think from the first episode where Petra and Abigail benefit from spree work, whereas up until that point, there'd been a full on resistance to it. Well, not full on because the changing of the vehicle that they drove away in at the end of two was spree work. So, but I think, you know, I think, I think they're starting to warm to that though. I do understand and I, I see the Abigail resistance to changing face being very important. And I think it's very important um, especially as a woman of color, to, to have that clarity about, no, I'm going to stand in the presence of who I am and fight as I am and not code switch my face to, to make me more acceptable or appealing to this. So I think, I think there's layers in the Abigail resistance beyond just the, the spree work of it all. Well, uh, Anna Costia in, in season two was just quite the right-hand woman to Petra and, and we begin this sort of the same relationship in a sense in the beginning of season three, but that path or, or you know, kind of alters itself as well um, when Anacostia ends up obviously going missing and um, and the circumstances that present themselves for her as well. Um, and now Petra's leaning more a, li a little bit more through Isadora who uh is someone who has been really loyal to alder and has been um an asset herself to, to alder how ha how does this new dynamic um and and reliance on science portion of things this season uh between the relationship with, with isadora and petra how does this new dynamic become another asset in a sense to them as well and 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 in turn, this relationship that we get to see between these two women who we haven't really seen much of before. I, again, I think it's a testament to Petra recognizing the wisdom that Alder had. And so, you know, those who Alder relied on make sense for Petra to have as her first tier of who she will rely on. Um, I think her issue wasn't about their counsel. I think it was about 
the choices that Alder was making with that information from them. But, you know, I don't, I don't see Petra as a shoot the messenger kind of, kind of witch. So I think, you know, I, I don't, I think she would recognize that Alder would surround herself with excellence. And again, I think that's part of her, what, who Petra would seek to surround herself with as well. And I think also the fact that Anacostia and Isadora would see that there hasn't been a tearing down of Alder's legacy by Petra, you know, like the portrait's still up. There's, there's, there's no disparaging, there's no campaign to change everything to, to erase that legacy. If anything, it's about protecting and building on it. So I think those who would have been fiercely loyal to Alder can see that, that Petra is not trying to erase her. And I think that would be important for them to see. And I, I also think um, as much as the gadgets and, and gizmos and, and things that the cabaret have invented, it basically also really comes down to a lot of science this season too. And that's not something necessarily technologically related, but the science of obviously like the poisoning of the mycelium, um, Penelope, whether she's uh, someone who can um, free or clear the name of, of them and then her having obviously been reconstituted in some way and then figuring out that and I feel like science is also um, another aspect that really has become beneficial for the Fort Salem side that hasn't really been pursued any other season as much as it has been so Isadora is um, is, is actually coming in pretty handy uh, as uh, as her weird science, <laughs> our science uh, comes to to uh, the front of things more. From season one, I have felt there is a deep allegorical parallel between Motherland and Fort Salem and the world at large that we're living in, and that the challenges that are getting envisioned and written about in our scripts are showing up in the wider world without too much difficulty spotting them and finding them. And I think this sort of discrediting of science and education and learning and wisdom um, has, has places us in danger. And, and I think it's meaningful and important that through another approach to storytelling without trying to beat people over the head, we're demonstrating that you rely on the people who know more than you do <laughs> to get you out of problems you don't have an answer to and if you know and science and consideration and education and learning and knowledge are important and we can't just we can't be afraid of learning things and we can't be afraid of those who dedicated their lives to learning things who are trying to help us with that knowledge absolutely i mean we talk about um, science, we talk about the relevant themes, and we talk uh, about what's going on in our political landscapes. I mean, we had a, a we had a, a pandemic. We have a pandemic still. Uh, we use science to come up with inoculations, like Isadora come, came up with inoculations. Yep. We have a poisoning of things. We have um, so much of like, Dr. Fauci. <laughs> we have here in, Mer in America um, the science that we rely on people to have our health care yeah. um and that's something that is like you said it's it's, it's got the backing of education research brilliant minds um dedication and and and, and uh, boards of people you know things like that that's science and it just it feels like you know we're we're talking about an alternative world but we're talking about our world at the same time too absolutely uh, it continues to reflect this this landscape that we're we're delving more and more into whether it's uh you know women's voices and women's rights you know trust in our government um our freedoms obviously our teachings that you know books to burn and then you know certain things that we're not allowed to teach anymore or talk about the bodily autonomy. The callers are a direct line to just having personal bodily autonomy, you know, to use your body as you see fit with whatever gifts it's been endowed with. And, and you know, the, the negating of access to, to that freedom, I think is so on the nose to so many of the challenges right now that women are facing. 
I, I was gonna say, I mean, uh, how, how does the, the prevalent topics that we see in this alternate universe serve as like a reminder and a call to action that just as as many steps forward as we have taken, we're not too far from, you know, taking those steps right back or falling back into uh, a past. The past is always sort of looming uh, <laughs> in the present as much now. I I think that's a, a really, hopefully a really important legacy from the show because anything you can create can be, can be dismantled. Anything that you can pass can be overruled. Anything that you can legislate can be, can be um, revoked. So the, the you know, I, I, I can't off the top of my head pull the author of this quote, but the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Is that Churchill? I think maybe, but I can't remember. Um, but it's the, the meaning has always stuck with me that you, you know, you, 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 everything is temporary. So therefore anything you think is fixed in finite isn't. And if it's a value to you, you protect it. Um, and you, you give it the attention and, and care that it requires to maintain it. And I think that that is everything from, you know, our, our pets to our freedoms and everything in between. You know, if, if it's important to us, we have to be responsible for it and take care of it. Absolutely. And um, like I said, we can't consider every, we can't consider things to be permanent. We can't consider things to be uh, already voted upon and forever. Um, we see so much yeah. being repealed and not codified or um, yeah. every single day there's something that uh, is coming up that's kind of turning a tide uh, and causing more fear and and um, we can't just it, it's now more important than not just voting you have to do more than just your part mm -hmm. and I think we have to recognize that you know oppression anywhere is oppression everywhere like we you know, I pay a lot of attention to the news that is happening around the world. And, um, and in particular, just south of our border, I'm in Vancouver. Um, and, I, and I will have friends say, you know, why do you, why do you pay so much attention to that? And I'm like, because we're all connected. And when ideas catch hold, they can be amplified. And so that which is happening over there can and does and is showing up here. And so we can't not invest our our attention and our time to the challenges the anywhere in the world so that's these are these are challenging times like everywhere which is an oversimplification of the highest magnitude, but <laughs> but again there's no it, it, it's simple because it's true it's fact it's it's not uh it's not complicated things are just really in flux and challenge and i think pat and, and i'm I've had it said, and I don't know if it's been said to me as a, as a comfort offering or if it's something that, that my friend believes, but that, that there is this hope that this is the dismantling of repressive systems trying to have a final grasp and grip before it all becomes more equal and fair and lovely. So I'm hoping that we're, this is just the, the tightening before the fist is unclenched, but I don't know. Your crystal ball will have to tell us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll work it on a, our, a magic eight ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we, we talk about um, these, these um, the relevant things that feel so heavy to us and, and continue to be so re relevant from the themes of motherland. But um, kind of before you and I were talking, um, we, we talked a little bit about hope. And I was saying that um, the season feels very Dickinsonian to me in the sense that you know, uh, there's this poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, and um, hope is also something that really sustains us when we need it the most. And things are seeming a little bit bleak <laughs> around Fort Salem for the time being, uh, as much as is going on around um, the country in this alternative world as well, not just on base as, as well. Um, so I wanted to ask about how, as we kind of transition into this back half of the season, how does the power of hope or the signifier of hope and how does that become a more prominent uh, um, turning point as we progress? What does hope really mean amongst the people um, in these specific times that we're starting to see as the back half stretches? 
Oh, um, hope is what keeps you going. You know, you have to hope that that the 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 small actions you take today amass over time to the result you're trying to create. I mean, you and and the hardest part is showing up. So I think that hope is the fuel that brings you to just simply show up and keep going. You know, when you're going through hell, keep going. And, and really there, what alternative is there? You know, like not, and because I think we all mi mischaracterize hope as this sort of almost joyous, happy pull. Whereas I think joy, hope is gritty and hope looks like work and hope is hard and hope is not easy. Um, and I think, you know, I think that is what this season I think is showing, you know, that, that it's, it's not this floaty feel good sensation. It's, it's grit and determination and at times storm and fury. Well said. <laughs> That's uh, it's the it's the mantra that really keeps not only obviously the show going and the, and the characters within the series, but I mean obviously the fans have really taken up that that mantra as well. Hope that keeps us fueling that um, with the campaign to save Motherland and have more seasons mm -hmm. of the show. That really gives the uh, fandom like the feeling that they can have an impact. That um, that this is something that. Um, their voices matter and hope is something that keeps that flicker flicker going oh absolutely well the the i mean you, the demonstration of grit and determination that the switch community has demonstrated on our behalf um is is nothing short of miraculous like we are all so moved and so touched and and I think it really made us want to be on our a-game all the way through because we knew how invested and how not that we wouldn't be otherwise but I think it just had that redoubling like where there was no there was no mourning the show while we were making the show we were like fully invested in like let's give a, a great finish and I've been in other things where people are you know, there's despondent that, that things are coming to an end. And we were like, oh my gosh, we get to finish this. Like we, there was a sense of enthusiasm and energy and excitement to be able to bring that. And I think that in large part was us channeling the excitement and anticipation for it that we know that the, the motherland fan community has, has so lovingly bestowed us with. So we felt a responsibility to, to do it right for you guys. Well, we, we talk about hope but there, there's a moment in episode six at the end of the episode between Petra and Alder uh, and of course the the cadets as well um, where where I guess kind of like Alder gets like sort of one last charge in a way to lead or one last like word of encouragement and, and storm and fury we talk about too but it, it just kind of spins things and, and gives the audience as much as it gives everyone who's on screen and then this beautiful moment of the cadets coming together and Petra's like running to the front and like it's Alder I gotta see for myself and and what's she gonna say why is she here and what's happening and and she just kind of gives this 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 word of encouragement this you know this this hope this crumb this 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 light amongst everyone and and that's really something that I carried with me after watching the episode um last night and just felt so close to these characters in that moment too and that whatever is going on here personally outside of a tv series um that i was inspired as much as i was seeing uh, everyone else be inspired on on screen and and i kind of feel like the swell of emotion to have filmed something like that and to be a part of something of that moment kind of felt special would have spelled special at least to, as well to, to all who are a part of that moment as well that was one of my favorite scenes to shoot with Lynn. Yeah, we, uh, that was a very meaningful scene for us, so. <sighs> it's, uh, it's the mutual respect that, that, you know, like to see between the two of them and obviously they're two leaders and they have passed together and 
it's not about whatever did happen in the past. It's about this moment we have to work together. We have to remember what our purpose is and who we are and what we have to do. And it just, it, it does. It feels like a, a candle. It feels like a catalyst. It feels like here's where that hope begins. And I'm, I haven't seen any other episodes and I'm not trying to talk about other episodes, but it, it, it really did. It, it's left such a, a lingering imprint on me that I feel, um, I can't wait for everybody to see the same Thank and you. just feel re-inspired and reinvigorated. And this is, this is exactly what, what does make this show so spectacular is, is these messages and these moments and, you know, maybe everybody else gets another, you know, gets another chance to, to reignite something in them that, like you said, maybe they, you know, some, somebody feels a little bit despondent still, or somebody feels like, oh, we haven't heard something or something, you know, that it, it kind of reinvigorates that little flicker for them too. I hope so. We also get a moment in episode six and this 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 interview is not going to come out anytime before that so that there's no spoilers that are released beforehand but there's a, a moment in, in episode six also um with willa specifically who says um daughter come to harm or she is not a mother and motherhood is a, is something that's seen in, in various lenses through motherland obviously petra and abigail and willa and rael but also the mycelium is called the mother as well. And, and Alder has been a mother to Anacostia and many of the cadets in a sense as well. So I wanted to ask, how does this really kind of encapsulate the various uh, views and, and scope of, of motherhood that we've come to know and we all see, we see in, in these facets as presented through motherland? How does this, this kind of comment in the sense of motherhood sort of come through the, the lens as we see various iterations of what ma ma the matriarch is within the series. I think the most impactful message is the variety of images of motherhood, is the sense of being of your mother and therefore bestowed with having been taken care of and needing to go forth and take care of whether, you know, and I, and I don't know that it is, you know, in some of the instances, obviously it's linearly, um, you know, mother to daughter, but I also think the sort of the caretaking of the mycelium, the, the caretaking of, I'm not answering this as well as it's forming in my mind. I, I think there's a diversity to the way motherhood is portrayed. Uh, part of why I've loved the way Petra has been portrayed is that she is demonstrated to be showing the juggle of her responsibilities all at once and that you have to move through them and that you sacrifice some for others at different times and it's complicated and it's messy and you do the best you can and it's hard and when you know better you try and bring that knowledge forward to, to do the next right good thing. Um, and that the scope narrows and, and widens depending on the issue. And so I think, you know, when it widens, you're looking at the whole caretaking of the world. And when it narrows, you're looking the care, at the caretaking of your child. But even in that, you're assisting this. And in this, you're, you're caretaking that. And so it's this sort of expanding and contracting that that relationship shows over a lifetime of both the mother and the child and um and the evolution of it all like it that it that it shifts that that you know alder was taking care of the mother and then the mother was taking care of alder that you know that that when petra was at her most challenged that's when her mother showed up to give her wisdom and that that doesn't end and and so this continuum of it all i think is also so important because i think we especially coming out of the last couple of years where we've been living these compartmentalized, isolated, fear-driven lives of, of, you know, wanting to not get sick or make others sick and caretaking through absence has been part of the equation. I think, I think we still have to be mindful of even in those absences we're taking care of and connected 
because we're conscious of our Im impact and our influence and our responsibility. So that's a convoluted answer, but I, I think I think that there's usually so narrow a focus on how motherhood is portrayed. And I think the diversity of it and the, the, the work of it, I think are really important messages for motherhood. And I kind of sort of have, have viewed Alder in a sense as like a mother nature persona in a way too, because mm -hmm. of the way she manifests uh, and um, uh, we see the mycelium manifest uh, and, and take care of her too. She's regenerated, yep. some, you know, into this, uh, I, I don't even know what to explain, <laughs> but I just keep thinking of her as like a mother, mother nature, especially because um, she, she, so many people, she, Lynn loves trees and like there's so many people who, you know, felt like she kind of became like a, uh, <laughs> they, they say it's like group. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, she feels like a mother nature to me in a way too especially also because um not mother nature but a mother in a sense too to tally in a way um mm -hmm. at times as well um with the caretaking um and obviously um tally had become a biddy at a point too mm -hmm. and so i feel like there's a lot of um motherly nature in that aspect as well yeah definitely and and speaking of tally we got a little tease from the motherland account the other day um where they were asking certain people about you know who would they want to be a mentor to them and jessica said isadora or petra <laughs> so i wanted to ask what kind of uh, pupil do, do you think uh that uh tally might be uh for uh, un under Petra's wing <laughs> or guidance. Oh, well. <laughs> Hallie would be earnest and diligent and studious and hard on herself. And I think she would strive for excellence, but being prepared to work for it. I think they're all very different. I think Abigail expects to be excellent because she's Abigail and she's bellwether. So she's just going to be excellent. Um, I think, <laughs> I think that Raelle um, has these gifts and is ambivalent about them until they can be used to benefit someone else. And I think Tally um, wants knowledge, like is, is, is wants experiences, wants to unravel the mysteries of the world and life. And so I think she is in awe of it and wants to know it and wants to be um, able to master it as well as to be of service to it, um, it being knowledge. And so I think, I think Tally would be an amazing student because I think it would be about the, the investigation and curiosity and preservation as opposed to about any internal ego um, or, or um, what's the word, or remuneration or, or, or compensation for that effort. I think she just wants to, to know all the things. I think so too. I, I think also through her power of, of sight that it gives her another perspective of, of someone else as well at the same time. So she would be able to gain this knowledge, but she also would be able to sort of see the nature within that at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the purpose. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully the purpose too. <laughs> yes, she would seek enlightenment for sure. Well, we are getting towards this uh the second half we've, we've hit the mid-season mark but uh there's there's only a certain episodes left there's only about four or so episodes uh, after six and um we're we're really just not really not ready to let go of these characters not ready to let go of this world um because of all of the ins inspiration and um the message is within and it's been such a pleasure to get to watch these characters grow just as much as it has been um to watch the the beautiful work that we get to witness um both on screen and in these precious moments that we get little glimpses of as well off screen and I wanted to just kind of ask after wrapping season three you know what are the lingering feelings that you've kind of felt uh in, in in portraying these this beautiful character and this incredible character who's become a leader 
just to people obviously through Fort Salem, but also um, people who, you know, really see themselves in Petra and see themselves through the, the lens and the eyes of these characters and the hearts as well. What kind of has left lingering to you, whether it's something about Petra or something about the series itself or? I have said it before and I'll say it again. I'm just so grateful that we got to to write a conclusion for season three, we like I wrote it, but that we as the show got to have a have a have a clear end to offer because to me there are so many layers and lessons to this world and to these three seasons that the fact that it will be concluded to me gives me hope that it will live on in streaming and people will find and learn and experience and welcome this world and and that it will continue to ripple forward in terms of creating community and creating um, understanding and and a place um, and to know that the other is recognized and welcomed because I think that's one of the things that was beautiful both in the storytelling as well as in the community who made Motherland. Um, it it was it was it's so cliche to say it was a little family but it was like we looked forward to seeing each other you you look forward to getting the new script to find out who you had scenes with so you know who you get to work with and it it I will miss it I will cherish it and I will try to foster that kind of environment on every show I go forward and work on because because once you've experienced that there's no reason it can't happen again and so I am so grateful for having been given that experience um, as, a, in, uh, as a workplace from, from Motherland. And, and I want to do my best to foster it. And I think the others will as well, because I think, I think it was a very special time and a very special group. And so, yeah. So I think that's part of it. I think, um, I think I definitely, am inspired by Petra's strength and bravery and seek to be more of both in my own life. I, I, I think that there's a lot of Petra that I want to, to continue to explore as Kat going forward. You, you've done such a tremendously touching work um, with, with, uh, with Ashley and in these beautiful moments that we get to see and, and um, these tender moments that have have really built up beautifully and poignantly because we saw obviously in season one like there was a lot of you know hard heading but you know between the two of them uh and then the relationship that we've gotten to watch through abigail and, and petra has um become so much more layered but also more of an understanding as well at the same time <laughs> So it's been really rewarding to get to watch the work that you and, and Ashley have gotten to do together through your relationship of Petra and, and Abigail. And um, I really thank wanted to just take the time to say thank you so much for this, this beautiful little bubble that you've given these great special characters. The, the two of you have been absolutely, absolutely inimitable in with the work together that, that we've gotten thank to you. see. And, um, and of course, uh, just just kind of to, to wrap up to say that this, this show just means so much to all of us and we don't get the chance, not everyone gets a chance to say, you know, face to face in a way like I get to or, you know, in that capacity, but just on, on the behalf of the, the Switches community that, uh, that I wanted to say thank you so much for being such a wonderful part of this show, bringing it to life, um, leaving these imprints that you've given to us that feel like such a blessing and gifts and just continue to have a deeper meaning to us as we watched over these three seasons. Thank you, that means a lot. That to you. I, I gratefully receive it. And, and again, the, the impact of being embraced um, by the Switch community has, has been transformative. It's been one of the most delightful and engaging experiences that, that my work as an actor has, has brought to me. And I'm, I'm very grateful. And, uh, and again, we are all just so hopeful that you find season three as satisfying um, in, in the watching and receiving of it as we, as we 
are endowing it with as we send it to you because we, we just really are, are grateful for the support and the love that you guys have demonstrated to us over the last three seasons. It's, it's sort of felt like we've, we've gotten to watch these characters grow up and we, we have, I mean, they've matured, obviously, uh, having, having to have matured uh, quite quickly. <laughs> and um, I think that's also um, what feels so meaningful too, is getting to see the growth um, and how um, rewarding that has been for all of us and um, the relationships obviously that have become built both on screen and off that make the show just so impeccable and uh, the cinematography and the wardrobe and the details and the lighting and the everything that just goes into making this series just absolutely absolutely stunning well thank you we're again so grateful that it's it found an audience who appreciated as much as we enjoyed making it so um and and thank you specifically for your work in amplifying our our, our show our stories us as individuals it's it's meant a lot to have you in our corner and so thank you and and starry constellation for taking the time to uh, to, to let pe more people know about us so thank you it means a lot my pleasure. I'm, I'm feel, I just feel very fortunate to have the, the opportunity to use our platform to share and, and to support it. It is such a beautifully in inclusive and, and essential world that we're getting to see portrayed. And um, uh, as much as we talk about, you know, the, the hope, it's just a kid, like, again, it fuels, it fuels me to feel inspired um, that we can, we can handle this, that we have a a community of switches together that um, have each other's back and, and care for each other and just um, make this world continue whether it's on screen or off. Yay, that makes me very happy because that that's the other part about it still staying accessible to people is that, you know, there's there's shows that I've gone back and watched three, four, five times, like the whole series and, and it hits differently each time. And as I evolve, my reception of this or the stories changes and and I just I think that there's so many levels that that this world has been created on that that I hope people find in in the successive viewings of it um, even more that enriches that experience for them beyond season three are there any other upcoming projects that you have that you you know or anything that we didn't talk about that you like to mention Oh, well, um, I'm really excited about some of the workshops I'm creating to help other actors and creative uh, professionals. So that's at thedramaclass.com. And so I've got my, my fall slate of workshops that we're developing, which are really going to be fun to be teaching again and, and, uh, and coaching folks and helping other artists contribute to these stories. So that's fun. And we're planning an August pop-up store for the my bookstore bizbooks.net so that will be exciting because we do everything online but every so often we go and do an installation somewhere and bring all the books and get to see people and and tell stories and hang out and so that's going to be a fun thing that we do with Railtown Actors Studio in August so that's coming up uh, my niece gets married on Saturday so that'll be fun because my bonus daughters and my and their families will be out from from where they live in the country so that will be awesome so there's lots of good life stuff coming up um, and as I told you, today was the day I finished my, my voice work for, for the last episode. So it's nice to have things to celebrate as I get a little bittersweet about saying, saying goodbye to Petra. Um, today was the last day I utter her words. So it's, uh, it is it, even more meaningful that I got to visit with you today because it's a, a special day to celebrate that and to, to know that it's, it's almost ready for you, season episode 10. Did they, did you get to keep any of your, your stars or decorations or something? I have a uniform or two. Oh, no, okay. I did. I, I, I kept, I kept my, both my dress blue or my dress blues and my, and my BDU, my, my combat uniform as well. So I have those just, yeah, that's nice to, to look over and get to see them and just know that they're there. And think fondly back on Petra and uh, be reminded yeah. of, of the woman, uh, the pillar, <laughs> the power. <laughs> well, and Petra introduced me to so many great people like you, you know, like Petra unlocked so many interesting and exceptional experiences for me 
that I will ever forever be grateful to her. So it's nice to have a little piece of her with me.